Let's have a look at some of the key ideas if we're doing a paired comparison experiment. So this is going to be different from what the two independent group one is. Um, and let's have a look at how that's different. So in a paired experiment, we need to be aware that every participant is going to do two tests, um, which is our control and the treatment. Okay, so for example, I might have a student and I'm going to give them a test before we begin the topic and then that same student is going to get a test at the end of the topic. Okay, so because the student is the same student, I'm going to be comparing their two test results. Okay, so it means I can't do a dot plot where I compare the before tests with the after tests because that assumes, when we create that kind of graph, the, it assumes that the groups are independent. Okay, that's the assumption. And in this case, it is absolutely not true. It's dependent because the score that I get in the second test depends on how I did in the first test. I'm hopefully going to improve. If I started with a low score, my second score should be higher than that, but it might not be horrifically high. Okay, or if I got a very high test mark in the first test, I could get an even higher one the second time round. So I've got to be very, very careful about when I use this and be able to recognise the scenario. So the process is that we take our group of students or group of participants and we're going to randomly allocate the order. Now this isn't always possible. As I said before, the example that I just used before, if I've got a group of students and I give them a test at the beginning and then at the end of the topic I give them another test, so each student is getting two tests, I can't randomly give them the end test first and then the first test last. Okay, in that case that's a scenario where it is not possible to randomly allocate the order. But it, I can, I will still treat it as paired data because it's two, two pieces of data from one person. So if I can randomly allocate the order, I will. And so that might mean that I get one group of students to do the control group first, and then they'll do the treatment group, the treatment test second, or the other way around, they'll do the treatment first, and then they'll do the control second. All right. So the order in which one they do first and second changes. Once I've got the two um, responses for each of those pieces of data then I'm going to find the difference between them and I'm going to analyze those differences. Okay one of the key advantages is that I need fewer participants so if I was doing it as two groups I'd need to have 15 participants in one group 15 participants in another so in total I would need 30 different participants to get 15 in each group. However with paired data because I'm doing two tests on that one group of people, if I've got a sample size of, um, sorry, not a sample size, say I had a sample size of 15, it means when I do the first test, I'm going to get 15 results. When I do the second test, I'm going to get 15 results. So that's a big advantage, is I do not need as many participants to be able to do it. All right. So I also need to think carefully about the order in which I which the treatments are given, which is our random allocation. So in terms of recording data, we're going to have our control and treatment groups, and again, we're going to be looking for that difference. So if I was testing a student's test mark, and say the first test they got 45, and the second test they got 60, that means the difference, I'm going to do the second one, treatment, take away the control, Okay, so in that case it would be 60, take away the 45, that would give me a difference of 15. So that means they got 15 marks more in the second one than they did in the first test. Alright, equally if I had somebody that got 50 in the first test and 25 in the second test, 25 take away 50, that means they get a value of negative 25. So they did worse in the second test, they got 25 marks less than they did. So I can get in the differences column, I can get positives and negatives. So analysis, 
I'm going to start by thinking in year 12 we um, have this idea about arrows graphs which is trying to show you the difference. It's trying to give you that graphical way to see the differences. So here's an example of it. And this is looking at an experiment where we've looked at writing times and students got to write with their dominant hand and their non-dominant hand. And we randomly allocated the order. So the, some students did their dominant hand first and then their non-dominant hand second and others did it their non-dominant first and dominant second. And so what we've got is at the top here, I've got my dominant hand times and each arrow refers to the difference between the time they took to do the test with their dominant versus their non-dominant hand. All right, so that's what, so each arrow represents the difference in one person's time. Equally, you can see what I've done now is I've taken each of those arrows so if that was a difference there, um, so that was going from about, oh, what's that, from about 40 up to, say, 155. So if I'm going from 40 up to 155, that difference, 155 minus 40, that would be a difference of 115 seconds. So on my graph here, around about 115 seconds, I would have that dot there. Okay, that dot there represents a person who took 115 seconds longer to write with their non-dominant hand compared to their dominant hand. If I've got a dot up the beginning here, so this one right at the beginning, that's about 15. So that tells me that particular person took 15 seconds longer to write with their non-dominant hand compared to their dominant hand. So each dot represents the difference in time for that person. Okay, so one of the things that I notice with this graph here, all of the arrows, when we look at all these lines, all of these lines are going in this positive direction. Yep, there aren't any lines going back this way. Um, and so that tells me that everybody took longer to write with their non-dominant hand than with their dominant hand. Equally on the dot plot, we can see that all the values are positive. So because all of the values are positive, that tells me that everybody took longer to write with their non-dominant hand than their dominant hand. Okay. So that would be the analysis that we're looking for. And we can talk about shape, centre, spread a little bit as well if we needed to. Um, going on to the answering the investigation question though, this is one of the key ideas. And we're still talking about that, could these results have been just due to chance? Because we randomly allocated the order, could I have got results like this just by random chance? Or do those results tend to be higher for one of the groups? So... What I want you to think about is an arrow. When I draw an arrow, let me just get a blank page, I could draw an arrow going that way or I could draw an arrow going that way. There's two possible outcomes. So there's a 50% just by a random chance, there's a 50% chance I get an arrow going that way and a 50% chance I get an arrow going the other way. Okay, just random chance. So what I need to think about is I want to compare how many arrows go left or right on the graph. If I'm getting results around about 50, that tells me half of the arrows are going one way, half of them are going the other way. These results could just be due to random chance. Whereas if I get values close to the zero or close to 100, so lots of arrows going in one direction or the other, um, and I'm going to use that value of around about 75% um, as my guide, that's when I have a sample size of 20, then if I've got... 75% or more of the arrows going in one direction, that means I'm a lot more confident that one of the variables could affect the other variable for my participants that I have in this experiment. So if I was also looking at your box plots, so you could also talk about comparing it to zero, and remember 75% of the data, if I was to shade in from the lower quartile upwards, that would be 75% of the data. Or if I had a graph here where there's zero, 
from that upper quartile downwards, that whole area there would be that 75% of the data. So if I have 75% of the data either above zero or below zero, then that gives me a good reason to be able to say, look, there's lots of my data that's positive or lots of my data that's negative. That's leading me to conclude that probably it's not just due to random chance. Okay, there's two conditions that we need to be able to meet. It, must, it depends on the experiment having been well designed and looking at that median. Okay, we could also do it looking at um, a confidence interval. And I've got an example of that just in the next one graph to show you as well. So if I looked at this graph here, we can see, remember all of these lines are going in that direction. So I would actually say 100% of the lines are going in that direction. So 100% of students took longer to write with their non-dominant hand compared to their dominant. If I'm looking at my dot plot here, okay, so the graph's actually starting there at zero, so oh, sorry, at 10, so zero is actually down here a little bit. All of the data is above zero. So in this case, I can say 100% of the data is above zero. Zero is not included in my confidence interval, is another way. That means I have got evidence to say that writing with your dominant hand has an effect on the time versus compared with your non-dominant hand. Okay, and that's what the conclusion I would want you to be able to come to.